All right, so let's sing, uh, where could I go, go but to the Lord? Um, that's G.
If it's nice, we can still go. That's the last time we plan to, uh, but uh, we'll play it by ear. I looked at the weather, and next week it's supposed to be 40 degrees with the humidity, so I might want to come in because that's too hot for me. No. <laughs> I like it out there, but at any rate. Um, so we're going to look at uh, next few weeks, Psalm um, 22, 23, and 24, uh, as I, when I get an opportunity at 11 o'clock. And it's a trilogy. So in 22, we see the good shepherd, the great shepherd dies for the sheep. 23, we see the good shepherd caring and providing for the sheep. And 24, the great shepherd returns in glory to reward his sheep. All right? So uh, we'll look at all those three in the days ahead. Uh, so David is the author of this psalm. There's no consensus on when David actually wrote this. Uh, but I read a few places, a few fellows have quoted, is uh, 993 B.C., or around there, when he was fleeing from his son Absalom. And, but everything doesn't matter if we know or don't know. Uh, numerous quotations from this psalm, though, are in the four Gospels, as well as Hebrews chapter 2, and it, this is a Messianic psalm. It talk, this is about the Messiah. Okay, It is Tom about David, absolutely, but it's a foretelling of Christ. So did you know that King David was a prophet? He was. All right. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, it says this, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulcher with us unto this day, therefore being a prophet. And as we go through the psalm, there's going to be numerous times, there's no way that David knew any of this stuff. There's no way. But God used them in the realm of a prophet. So let's look the Lord in prayer before we start. Dear Jesus, uh, thank you for this time. Thank you for these dear folks. Thank you for a wonderful 9 o'clock service we had. And thank you for the visitors that were out. And what a blessing that is. And thank you for a great spirit in our church. And Lord, allow that to continue. And Lord, I pray that you would give us a good time now in your word as we uh, go through this psalm. And uh, Lord, again, seeing your graciousness, your love for us, what you've provided, salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 22, and we're just going to read a few verses, 1 to 5, to start off. Uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not in the night season, and am and, and, and not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praise of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. So the opening words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You, you have read that in the New Testament, right? That's in the New Testament. These are the same words spoken by Jesus 
as he hung on the cross. That's found in Matthew 27, 46. And it's involved in the transaction of dying for the sins of the world. Christ made him sin for us. He took the sin. It was likely at noon day of that uh, day that God the Father imputed the sin of the ages to his son. And we say that because the sun refused to shine. Right? It didn't shine for the sixth to the ninth hour of the day. Though inc incredible difficulty, so much so that we can't comprehend it, the Lord is still trusting the Father. Even though he's taking all that sin, and though his father's turning his back from him, he's still trusting him. And David's trusting in God as well. I'm sure there's times in your life when you have hurts, when you have problems, in the daytime, nighttime, it doesn't matter when, and you're feeling low, we can still trust our father, amen? He's still trustworthy. We can trust him to help us to get through it. Our forefathers have trusted in God in their day, and he delivered them from um, their crisis. He can deliver us. And let me tell you, uh, as a parent, grandparent, uncle, aunt, what, it's a really good thing for you to tell the younger generation of trials you went through and how God provided. Amen. That's a really good thing. Because it helps them understand, well, that, that God did that for uh, Lala, Lolo, whoever you are, or grandma, grandpa, whatever uh, culture group you're from. To say, hey, they did it, God did it, maybe he can do it for me. Yeah. You know, it's really important. Uh, I'm so glad I have opportunities through the years to sit down with my grandfather and he tell me about what happened in his life. That's really good for me. And I try then to relay those stories to my kids. I say, hey, this is what happened to grandpa, you know, so forth, so on. Because it just encourages, God can do it. Again, just like I mentioned this morning in the service, God's not in some outer space in a different place altogether. They're not caring. He loves us. He cares for us. He wants us to come to him. All right, verse number six. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despise the people. All they that see, uh, see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lip. They shake their head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he should deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near me, for there is none to help. So we see some humility here, right? This is definitely on display. A worm is a creature of the ground. Helpless and unwanted. The only time you want worms is when you're going fishing. <laughs> right? That's it. There's no other time I want to see a worm. Not that they're super gross to me, but they're not. They're useless. Uh, David was at a low point in his life. He was disdained. He felt rejected. So that does fit in with the situation of uh, the writing being around Absalom's rebellion, right? That, that fits in that time period. Uh, he, and even when he was, Saul was hunting him down. I mean, Saul was after him many times in the wilderness of Israel. The application to our Lord is his suffering is very apparent. He was despised and rejected of men. Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. As he hung on the cross, the entire world had turned against him. There, there was no one, very, it was just a small handful who were at the cross there for the Lord. The Roman soldiers crucified him. The Jews rejected him just a few hours before. Crucify him! Crucify. They were yelling. Do it! Make it happen! In Isaiah 52, verse 14, as many as, uh, were astonished, uh, astonished by thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. The Messiah was terribly disfigured by his enemies. And verse 7, uh, doesn't that situation remind you of what took place with the soldiers and all they that see me laugh me to scorn they shoot out their lip they shake their head and that's a very vivid what took place with the soldiers at the cross david states that he'd been with god since his birth right verses 9 and 10 i read them the lord had been david's god since he was born so god was obligated to be with him listen we're gods god's obligated to be with us he's not going to say oh no i'm I'm done with that person today. They're no longer part of the family. No, God's obligated. He's, we're part of the family of God. We've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're part of the family of God. He's obligated to take care of us. And 
He wants to take care of us. Now, this is desire. So David is wanting God to intervene and, and, and bring deliverance. Verse 11. Now, be not far from me, for trouble is near me, for there's none to help. This verse represents our life on times, doesn't it? Uh, it so much does. Trouble is near. The word trouble is not referring to an invading army or raids on the nation of Israel. It means distress. It means anxiety. It means affliction. Trouble sometimes is our own doing, isn't it? We do it to ourselves. You know, and we, uh, we're, out of, we're out of sorts with what we should be doing. We get off track. We speak viciously, maybe. We're out of turn. So there's times when trouble is our doing, but there's other times when trouble is not our doing. It's not. But trouble's at hand. Um, I can think, I can remember, I said I read this verse this week, I was thinking about it, and I still remember being in the Hall of Faithway. So I lived at Faithway. I went to college the first year. That first summer I went home to work, and then after that I just stayed. The, the church was my home. That's where I lived there in the dorms the entire time. All right? It's not much fun when you're in that building all by yourself. I'm going to tell you right now. There's no one around. But at any rate, I remember being in the hallway on the phone. My dad phoned, and he told me, he said, Mark, mom's got cancer. she got breast cancer. And they're going to do surgery. They're going to do chemo. And that's the plan. You know, we'll keep you updated and things. And I still remember hanging up that phone. Like, how do you prepare for that call? That was before you get a text or anything. You know, I hung up the phone. I was like, what's, what's going to happen now? Right? We don't, no one knows. You know, no one knows. And I, I remember walking away. I was like, should I go home? Should I go back and uh, spend time with my family, with my mom? And, like, that was trouble. Now, I didn't do it. It was not my fault. I, I didn't bring that trouble upon myself. But the idea is that, hey, I can go to the Lord. And this trouble's near me, but there's no, none to help me. Like, I went back to um, my dorm, and my dorm mates couldn't do anything. So they could hardly do their own homework. Like, you know, <laughs> there's no way they could help me in this situation, you know. Uh, I had to look to the Lord. There's none to help me. That's the Lord. I have to go to Him. And David experienced the same thing. So it encourages me to know that David can rely on God, and that's my own story. I mean, there's others as well, but that's another story. God is able to be relied upon. He's reliable. He's the most reliable of the world. Many bulls, verse 12, have compassed me. Strong bulls of fashion have beset me around. Uh, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a rav uh, raving and roaring lion. Trouble is near and there was no one that could deliver them. And we, we really understand how powerful our God is when there's no way that we can see and escape. Right? Uh, there, and, and there's times in life we don't even really know that we're in trouble until after, like, wow, God protected us. We didn't even know. Uh, um, so I read a story this week of uh, uh, Spurgeon. He actually, I didn't know he came to Canada, but he came to Canada and he actually was preaching in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And they built some, I don't know who in particular built it, but they built a huge timber meeting place. I think it was like in November, uh, that time period. And uh, before Spurgeon showed up for the day of the meeting, there was a heavy snowfall, wet, heavy, you know, snowstorm, lots of snow. Went in, he preached for the day, I don't know exactly how long. As the last person walked out of that building, it collapsed. <laughs> Fell down. No one was hurt. And, but that was God's protection, right? God watches out. Our God's powerful, and he watches over us when we're in trouble. It demonstrates that there's no, there's no mere coincidence. I like to say there's no quinky dinks, okay? There's none. God is in control, and he has a plan. All right? And so uh, Basha is mentioned here. It's a, a fertile area uh, of, of the east of the Sea of Galilee. Today we would know it as the Golan Heights, all right? That, that's how we would know it to be described today. The wild bulls encircled they, the, the prey and moved in for the kill. He, he moves from bulls to roaring lions. Uh, I mean, David might have been thinking of Solomon's minions and different things. And he could have been thinking, and, and as he was a shepherd, it could have happened to him as well. Likewise, our Lord was surrounded by the high priests, elders, scribes, 
Pharisees, and other leaders of Israel. And their goal was his destruction, wasn't it? That day, when he, when he was crucified, their goal was to see him destroyed. They were angry bulls. They were roaring. Verse number 14. And I poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melted in the midst of my bones. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them. They cast lots for my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste, haste thee to help me. Doesn't verses 14 18 remind you of the uh, crucifixion? Yeah. Very vivid. Stripped of his clothes. Uh, the piercing of his hands and his feet. <coughs> and, and as he hung on the cross. Uh, so... I may tell all my bones and they look and stare upon me. I, I was reading some articles this week about crucifixion and how bones would be shifting and moving and be dehydrated. And so the idea that you, could, you can't see the real bone, but through the skin, you know, the bones would be seen, you know, protruding, not natural, right? That, that, that's just so vivid. And you know what is incredible? I mean, and then the strength fading away, being dehydrated and stuff. What's incredibly... Uh, amazing and, and really I didn't realize this till this week as I was studying out David is described the crucifixion but he had never witnessed one he had never seen one before so for one crucifixion was never a form of punishment corporal you know death penalty punishment by the Jewish people never it was never part of their culture and and why I highly doubt he ever seen a witness is because it was actually started by either the Assyrians or the Babylonians well, the Babylonians weren't around in David's day. Not like we know them today. And it wasn't until the Persians took that form of punishment and death penalty, and they systematically made it part of their judicial system for punishment. I mean, this is long before David that time. I mean, this is him, the Lord using him as a prophet again, telling us what's going to take place. All my bones are out of joint. Um, so as a victim of a Roman crucifixion, uh, they were lifted up, they were nailed at, on the ground to the poles and uh, to the cross, and they were allowed, the, the Roman soldiers didn't care. Now, if you were convicted and crucifixion was your verdict, and that's what's going to happen, they did not care about you. You know, slap you down, nails, hand, feet, and then plunk old bang old in a big old hole they got for the base of the cross, and then you would be jolted and often popping many bones out of joint. That is extremely painful. All right, and then think that you have to lift up your body to get breaths and stuff. I mean, the pain is beyond my comprehension. I'm a wimp. I can't handle pain very much at all. But this is what Christ did. It was hanging on the cross with bones out of joint. So incredible. Definitely his shoulders, and I think uh, often they know have record that elbows were popped out as well during that time, like when that crucifixion. And a pack of hungry wolves, they circle around the Lord, the high priests and things. You know, they were jealous folks. They were jealous. The Lord, the, the crowds were following them, the Lord, not them. And I'm going to tell you right now, never under, underestimate what jealousy can do to you and then what you will do to others because you are jealous, all right? You, you don't underestimate it. And then the lackeys that they had. I mean, just think about this too. Just a week before... Now, they were out with the palm leaves, right? As Jesus came in, uh, Hosanna! You know, they were rejoicing, the crowds, not the lackeys and the high priests. They were upset, but they had turned them against the Lord. I mean, vivid, very vivid. Verse uh, 18, uh, they parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Correlate that to John chapter 19, verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garment and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And they said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, who it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled. They parted my raiment among them, for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Down verse number 20. 
deliver my soul from the uh, my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. The the sword in verse twenty uh, is highly probable, and that is referring to the authority of the Roman government, for it was Pilate who authorized Christ's death. And then darling, is, in verse 20, means my only one. My darling. My only one. And it's referring to, you know, child. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very powerful world, word when you know what it means. My, my only one. My only one. And through this uh, plea for deliverance, impending death, uh, in verse 21, talks about that, save me from the lion's mouth. Um, and uh, David had been through the valley of conflict and death uh, very many times where he needed to be delivered. Verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye, ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye that the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all ye seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. He moved from suffering, very detailed suffering, to praise. That's what's taking place here. David perceived God's deliverance was at hand and he began to praise him. And in the view of Jesus, though death was at hand and the resurrection, and the plus stand of resurrection, and the glories were near. They were close. You know, they're they around the corner. God's people, uh, direct reference now is to Israel, but it's a definitely application for us as Christians. We're to glorify the Lord. That's our responsibility. A day in, day out. David knew from experience that God does not despise nor hide from those in crisis. He hears, we have hope. He hears you. You have hope. <clears throat> Wherever you're facing. Uh, I, I, in a crowd this size, even if there's only four people in the crowd, it doesn't matter the size of the crowd, we all have problems. Some of them are significant, and other ones are not so much. But we all have them. And that should give us great encouragement that he knows, he hears, and we have hope in him. And we need to praise him for it. We're thankful if someone, uh, we're stuck on the side of the road and uh, you uh, you know you phone someone and they're like oh yeah I'm gonna come help you you're excited <laughs> is your car fixed yet no it's not your car's not fixed yet but you know there's hope yeah. you know that person can help you so right so the idea is that with the Lord we can trust him he will help us mm -hmm. verse 26 the meek shall eat and be satisfied they shall praise the Lord that seek him your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn uh, unto the Lord. All the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the, is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. And all they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. So we see a number of thoughts uh, ex expressed here. God will, uh, will bless the lowly and satisfy them. God will bless the lowly and satisfy them. The word meek here is the thought of one of the lowly in heart. God will bless. God will bless them. And those who seek the Lord will praise Him. He never failed those who come to Him for salvation. Aren't you so glad about that? You know, I have never worried when I'm testifying or I'm witnessing to someone or encouraging someone to make that decision for Christ. I'm never worried like, oh, I hope He doesn't fail this time. Yeah. Never! Never worry about that. I'm like, do it! There's urgency, not because his power fails, but you need this to make this decision. You know, but his, his power is never going to fail. He's going to deliver. He's going to deliver. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall uh, come unto me, uh, come to me, and he that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. Our spirit, our heart is eternal. It will live forever. Although death may place our body in the grave. You know, yesterday we had the memorial service for uh, Linda, our dear sister. They have buried her in Glen Oaks. That's where her body resides right now. But she's with the Lord. Her spirit lives forever. And she's with the Lord. And those who have accepted Christ as Savior, you know, forever separated from the Lord. 
in hell. The focus of the psalm turns to the millennial reign as well, of for the kingdom is of the Lord, the end of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, the verse 27, 28. David looked forward to the reign of the Messiah. Did he have any idea about the millennial reign? There was no teaching on that yet. You know, but he, again, he's being used as a prophet, talking about what's going to take place. So we see in this psalm the, detect, uh, the, the picture depicting the agony of the cross, the resurrection, and he looks forward to what will take place. You know, and God promised Abraham in chapter uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, that through the nation of Israel, the entire world would be blessed. And, and the descendants of Israel, of Abraham, well, one of the descendants of Abraham is Christ. That's how the world is blessed, through Israel. And he's going to come, and he's already come once, right? And lived, and ministered, and died, rose again, provided salvation. He's coming again. And when he comes, he's going to rule and reign, and there will be justice. Uh, there will be no corruption. Now, he's going to do it right. And that's what's going to take place. When Jesus returns, even the high and mighty and prosperous ones... You know, some, I don't know how many times I've read Psalms 22. I mean, I love reading through Psalms that I told you before. But, I, read, you know, as, as you study it out, it's a little different. All they that be fat. Well, you know what that means, right? They're, they're not skinny. Right? All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. So, in, and especially in this time period, in David's day, in order to be fat, you had to be prosperous. Right? You, you, you're not getting fat if you're poor. You know, you, you are prosperous. You will worship him. You'll, what does it say? The fat shall eat and worship. And they go down to the dust. So this is the idea of lowly, down in the dust. They will worship. Everyone will worship. There's no one who's getting away from it. Everyone will bow the knee. Everyone. A seed shall serve him. It shall be account to the Lord for a generation. And they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto the people that shall be born that he had done this. Uh, though the day is coming when we all will serve him, you know, we'll serve him in the kingdom. In the meantime, a small seed or a remnant will do his work in a wicked time. We live in a wicked time, a wicked age. I, I believe the Lord's return and rapture is imminent. That's right. That's the right word. Imminent. Right there. It's right there. And we'll be carried away. But until then, hey, or the Lord allows us to pass away, we have work to do. We got opportunities to serve him. And in every generation, there were those accountable to the Lord. There were those who trust in Christ. There were those who serve the Lord. And it was true then in David's age, and it's true today. God has made sure in this dark age there will always be a witness and a testimony of his righteousness and grace. It was it Elijah, right? Elijah? You know, he, he got pretty upset, right? He was he was getting chased by that wicked queen Jezebel, and he's in that broke, he's really having himself a pity party that he was the only one. And the Lord says, Oh, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Can anyone remember? Seven thousand who had not bowed the knee. That's a remnant. They're always a remnant who are going to serve God. And, and and the emphasis is not on what God's children can do for him. Rather, the fact is what he had done for them. He had done this. He says, never our strength. It's never our strength. Because our strength is insignificant. Mm -hmm. It's peanuts. doesn't even really register on any strength levels, okay? It's so insignificant. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. You know, um, in our lives, there's times when we're super busy, all right? And... This past uh, weekend has been pretty busy for us here at church. Uh, do memorial service, church today, and different things. And I'll be honest, I, I got to psych myself up for those busy times. I'm like, okay, I can get through this. I can, no, I get this. I can't do it. I need Him. You know, I need the Lord, and I need to go to bed early. I do that too. All right, but the reality is, we need the Lord day in and day out to do what we need to do. We need to trust upon him. You know, folks, I've been pastoring for 23 years. There's still, most times I get up to preach, I'm still nervous. 
It's not old hand. I never wanted to be old hand. I always want to have that. Just, because this is important. Right? This, this is the word of God I'm handling. I need to do it right. I don't want to say uh, things amiss. And I know I have. But I don't want to do it on purpose. You know, I want to declare the truth. I want the truth to be declared. And it's only by his hand I can do that. So I hope that's helped you understand this chapter in a greater way. And uh, Lord willing, we'll examine Psalm 23 next Sunday at 11. And I hope today, this service, 9 o'clock service, the baptism, the fellowship, the eats, I hope it's all been encouragement to you. To stay at it. Just keep going for Jesus. And be encouraged to be more like him. Let's pray, we'll be dismissed. Dear Jesus, thank you for a great day. It's still the morning. And Lord, thank you for what you've done in our lives today. And, uh, we don't deserve it, but we're so thankful for it. Your blessing, your encouragement, correction. Lord, I pray that we would stand fast for you. We would reach out to those lost in this day, Lord, and that we show them the light of the gospel. And Lord, help us to love you more. Help us to serve you more. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You're dismissed.